default. I'm part of the social media team at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And uh, joining me, as always, we've got uh, the better half of the social media team right over here. There's Emily. Hey, Emily, how you doing this morning? I'm doing wonderful. Thanks, Patrick. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for tuning in with us this morning awesome. slash afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. For, uh, good evening. If you're going to good bed evening. to this content, we'll try to make we'll try to make it worth worth your worth your bedtime while. Um, so uh, there's Emily there. Uh, she's going to be the one fielding all of your amazing questions. So feel free to send those in. Uh, we also have over here to this side, we've got uh, George Matsumoto from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. He'll be answering your questions over on M. Uh, Facebook pages. Um, and then uh, right here below me, uh, on the other side, we've got Susan Von Toon, who is part of the uh, Embari's uh, amazing digital engagement, social media world uh, team over there. So uh, Susan will be answering all of those questions over there as well. Um, but joining us here this morning, our very special guest for this Mysteries of the Deep, all about the midwater marvels of the Monterey Bay. Yes, round of applause, everybody, if you would please, for Rob Sherlock, who is over here on this side of the screen. Rob, how are you? you doing this morning i'm i'm doing great thanks patrick awesome so i'm gonna see uh zoom has made some changes to how it does the uh the switching let me oh there you go your full screen there rob rob can you tell us a little bit um about who you are and what your role is uh at the monterey bay aquarium research institute what are you doing out there sure sure so i am a senior research technician and i work in the midwater ecology lab with bruce robeson and kim reisenbickler um so as such i i think of myself as a midwater ecologist and we focus on the communities of animals that live anywhere from just below the surface to you know just above the bottom and a lot of these animals are really fragile. Many of them are gelatinous, like this tomatrid worm in the background behind me here. Um, that makes them really a unique community and really difficult to collect with traditional methods like nets that are trawled through the water. So I'm not sure how much background you want me to go into at this point. Oh, Patrick, no, that. But, uh, no, that's that's perfect. Yeah, thank you for for the quick intro. So, um, for those of you out there who have seen a few of these mysteries of the deep, questions about that midwater, those animals that are between the surface and the sea floor, uh, get those ready, send them their uh, our way because um, Rob is going to be able to uh, explain all of that. And I know that there's already questions that are being firing off right now. I can see Emily checking the 15 screens that we have just to the hold on to the volume of questions over there. But before we get to those questions, let's do a quick little uh, intro here explaining a little bit more about uh, Embari and where we um, and where we're headed here with this with this discussion and if I can nail the transition uh, let's see right here let's give it a shot yeah here we go so uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute is what you see right here up on the screen we're gonna call it Embari during this presentation it's located about 20 miles north of the aquarium in Moss Landing basically right there in the center of the Monterey Bay and if you head over there you might see those smokestacks there in the background that's the Moss Landing power plant and in front of it here in the harbor is one of Embari's research vessels this is the Rachel Carson and this here is the Western Flyer named for John Steinbeck's Western Flyer um, and these are research vessels that head out into the Monterey Bay and all around um, the ocean world looking for uh, amazing things to to discover with really cool bits of technology like aboard the Western Flyer here the ROV dock rickets an ROV is a remotely operated vehicle which means there's nobody on board uh, this vehicle it goes down uh, about 11,000 feet for this particular vehicle a little bit shallower but uh, no slouch over here for the ROV Ventana literally our window into the deep sea and these robots go into this inner space of planet ocean with cameras and lights and that's how we're going to be able to bring you all of the video footage that we'll be talking about here today uh, that camera feed is streamed directly back up to the surface where scientists and pilots in the control room are able to see what's going on there in real time you can see one of those 
bright comb jelly is right there. Uh, and one of the reasons that we're able to do this is if I can nail this transition here is we have a deep sea canyon out here uh, with some uh, really amazing, here we go, nice. Um, so here is a new animation from uh, the Ambari team. You can see here the Monterey Bay. Uh, there's Ambari there in the middle. We are obviously on the Monterey Peninsula and flying out from the Moss Landing Harbor. If you were to drain the ocean, which we don't generally recommend, uh, Trooper recommends not uh, draining the ocean. Um, yes, please, please don't. <laughs> yeah, um, if our processor can catch up here. Uh, if you drain the ocean in our backyard, you would see effectively the Grand Canyon out here in the Monterey Bay. The Monterey Submarine Canyon is a mile deep from its rim to its deepest point, and there's another mile of water stacked on top of it. So the deepest point of the Submarine Canyon is two miles deep of water above. And so this uh, amazing natural feature that we have here off the coast is what allows Ambari researchers to head out and study the deep sea in a very special way because normally it might take days, months to head out uh, to your research area, hang out there long enough to get your data and come home, whereas we have the deep sea available right there. And without looping back over too much, we're now back with all of us here. So I hope that gave a proper introduction of who we are, what we're doing. It uh, looks like there's some stuff here in the chat that I'll move out of the way there. Um, so, Rob, that's our playing field. That's a little bit about Ambari. I hope we did okay. But uh, first, let's go to uh, Emily. Emily, can you tell us what is our first few questions here for Rob to get, get us going? Yeah. We've got kind of the standard first few questions that people are throwing at us here, Rob. Uh, when we talk about the canyon, I know, Patrick, you um, just mentioned how deep it was out there. Uh, but one of the top questions that we always get, what's the pressure like down there in the Monterey Canyon? Oh, well, geez. Um, you know, it's something on the one hand that we don't have to deal with because we use those ROVs, those remotely operated vehicles that Patrick talked about. So we're not actually going down in manned submersibles, make, make sure that's clear with everybody, but there are pressure changes that would occur with any of these critters that we collect. And, you know, so all of us are sitting here right now with about one atmosphere of pressure uh, over our over our heads, right? Uh, given whether we're at sea level or whether we're up at elevation of mounds or something, but more or less, there's an atmosphere of pressure up over us. Add another atmosphere every 10 meters that you go down in the ocean. So you just go down 10 meters and all of a sudden you've doubled that amount of pressure uh, that you're dealing with there. So if, if that gives you any kind of an indication, um, when we're going down, you know, most of the work that we do is a thousand meters deep and above, but but that'll give you a little bit of an indication of, of the pressure changes. They're, they're pretty extreme. And so we study these animals by and large, we, we do make some collections, but most of our data are video data. And we study these animals in situ in part because we don't want them to have to deal with those pressure changes. They're difficult to keep. And the aquarium has made some great inroads and the deep sea exhibit is going to be a very fascinating thing for that reason, but it's a good thing to keep in mind because it makes uh, husbanding, hus keeping these animals in captivity uh, no mean feat, tricky. Now, Rob, while you were uh, while you were discussing that in the background, I, I played a video of um, a styrofoam uh, head basically shrinking there behind you. Uh, in my files, it's called the shrinking cup. So I was, it looked like a little bit of uh, Art Nouveau there behind you, but seeing that styrofoam head there collapsing in the background, I thought maybe we were going to watch a cup. But anyway, um, that pressure there that you were describing there represented um, by that change going down all the way to 3,000 meters there in, in that video that was playing there. Um, yeah, perfect. You're perfect. Rock. And you probably saw that the greatest change was right there at the surface and then it just kept getting smaller. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. So um, under pressure, uh, not just, you know, that that um, that Bowie and Queen song. Right. Uh, it's uh, definitely something that that Tom just from behind you is is experiencing all the time. Uh, Emily, more questions there for Rob. And then, Rob, uh, after this uh, question, we'll go to uh, maybe some of your favorite study species, some of the science that you're that you're doing. We'll we'll play some of those. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Pat, we actually got a, a very specific question. And, and Rob, I don't know uh, if you want to speak to this or uh, if uh, we want to save this maybe for another time. But uh, what are turbidity currents and how Ooh. did those help shape the Monterey Canyon? 
Wow. Well, that, you know, that's certainly not an area of expertise that I have, but it's, you know, turbidity currents are essentially what, you know, you'd, you'd think of when you think of something that's turbid, it's, you know, maybe these sediments that are kicked up by currents and then advected along such that, you know, they'll change the transmission of light in the water column and, and actually look turbid. I mean, we go down there with remotely operated vehicles and we take our lights down with us and we do see sometimes layers where sediments have been advected off the canyon wall, probably by currents and, and come out into the midwaters where we're exploring. Um, we have instrumentation uh, called a transmissometer that can measure that kind of thing, at least in a rough way in terms of the percent change of light transmission, uh, you know, by, so we can kind of monitor things like that. But we tend to stay up off the bottom and away from a lot of those currents um, when we're when we're operating in the in the midwaters there. Gotcha, awesome. Turbidity current. If you had that on your yeah. on your bingo card for for the day there, <laughs> um, yeah, I wasn't expecting that. One. Yeah, there you go. Um, okay, well, so Rob, can you tell us uh, a little bit about some of your your favorite study animals? I'll try to pull up those those clips while we go there in, in the background. Uh, maybe with uh, with the the zoom background that you have right now over there. Uh, let's maybe talk about that Tomoptris worm and then move on from there. What do you think? Sure, we can we can do that. Um, I you know I maybe I can pick up a little bit where I left off before with. Sure. You know, I think was saying that many of these animals are, are fragile and difficult to collect with nets. And something I'd like to like to point out before getting to the Tomoptris is that this is something that that Bruce and Kim were keenly aware of when they came to um, Ambari, you know, almost, well, 30 some years ago, actually, because they had a background in trawling and in dragging nets to the water and looking at what came up in those nets. Um, but they also had a lot of experience using HOVs, which are human occupied vehicles and using scuba diving to look at the animals that, that were out there. And they saw just, you know, what, what they saw coming up in the nets was not necessarily the same thing that they saw with their own eyes when they went out to explore. And so one of the first things they began to implement when, when uh, they first got to Mabari some 30 years ago was a long term monitoring program for these animals that we're talking about today. So we call that the Midwater Time Series. And that is something that I have been fortunate enough to be involved with for the 24 years uh, that, that I've been at Mabari. So, and, and actually more recently to, to a project that I've actually managed. Um, and it's become really apparent just how important and how interesting uh, this community of animals are. Okay, and, and one reason why I chose this Tomoptrid as a background is because they are just, they really are an animal that illustrates this three dimensional world that is the midwaters. I mean, if you watch them move, and I'm not sure, you probably have some good video there, perhaps, Patrick. I do, but, yeah, here it comes. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's something George and, and Susan can confirm too, I think, that seeing these animals move in the water really impresses upon you just that they live in and are well well evolved to dealing with this three-dimensional environment they can uh, they're so graceful and and forwards backwards stopping you can be heading very quickly they're very difficult animals to collect with the rovs um because they can head in one direction and abruptly change you know direction and speed and and reverse you know 180 degrees so they're they're pretty neat yeah, we got the bristle worm there, Tomopterid worm, sorry, uh, in, in the yeah. background there. Uh, can you describe to the folks out there maybe why that gut is red there? We're noticing maybe some difference between your Zoom background and the and uh, and then tomo the Tomopterid worm that we have a video of. What's up with the red gut? Sure, sure. Well, a lot of animals down in uh, the deeper ocean have a red lining to their guts because that helps them to, when they ingest prey that might bioluminesce, that pigmentation will keep them from glowing from the inside out and, and perhaps advertising themselves as a meal to some other predator. So that that's one reason that many animals have pigmented guts. And as far as the 
uh, dancing bristle worms go, the tomatoid worms go, you know, for a long time, we thought there was maybe a single species or maybe just a few species out there. But, uh, you know, we have found through molecular studies over the years that there are actually a good deal of uh, a number of tomatoid species out in our part of the world here and probably in the deep ocean everywhere. So that would explain why, you know, some have a, a pigmented gut perhaps and others do not. And, and they may have different prey items that they are eating. Uh, the ones without the pigmented gut may feed on things that, that don't bioluminesce and it's never been something that uh, they needed to worry about. Gotcha. Excellent. All right. Well, a um, little bit on the Tomoptris worm. I want to make sure that if there are uh, any um, any burning questions here for our bristle worm uh, fans out there that we that we get to them. Emily, what did the folks want to know out there? Yeah, you know, this is such an alien animal to so many people. Uh, Rob, people are curious, is this what those Tomoptris worms actually look like to the naked eye? Oh, you know, some of them are quite large. Um, some of them can be tens of centimeters uh, in length. And yes, this is very much what they look like. This particular image was taken in a plankton chrysal, which is a, a kind of a circular aquarium that we use when we do collect animals. It, it has no corners. And so for these animals, which are used to having no obstructions in the world that, that they live in, at least no hard obstructions, um, then uh, we can we can keep them a little bit uh, for a little bit while in a plankton chrysal. But yeah, this is very much what they look like. Um, they're often that kind of bluish color that you would see there when when they're illuminated. And one of the neat things about uh, Tomopterus about the dancing bristle worm is they actually have a yellow bioluminescence. So most of them can produce their own light, but they but they do it in so they look actually yellow, and that's really unusual. That's not common. I'm not sure if Steve Haddock. I know he talked about bioluminescence. I'm not sure if he talked about that particular uh, feat at all. But but yeah, interesting aside about these guys. Yeah, he did a little bit. I've actually got that yellow bioluminescence there playing uh, in, in the background. Can you tell us what that uh, bioluminescence, for those who maybe haven't heard the term before, what it is and what this might be used for? Sure. I'd suggest watching Steve's present live stream, which is great. But, um, but the nutshell is that bioluminescence is light that is emitted uh, by the animal, you know, as opposed to fluorescence, which is really something that's light that that is reflected back from the animal. So sometimes we can use the ROV lights and illuminate something and we'll get a fluorescence back. But if you, if you are in the dark and you're staring at an animal and it glows, then that's bioluminescence and that's generated by the animal itself or by bacterial symbionts that, that live with that animal. That's right. Yeah, here, I'll just show some folks here in the background here. So here uh, is an example there of this is not bioluminescence there on this comb jelly that you see going by those little rainbows that you're used to. That is light diffraction of our camera lights bouncing off of the comb rows of this comb jelly here. So what you're seeing there, that is not bioluminescence. That is uh, light that's being produced by the camera lights. But then here is that same comb jelly in the dark producing its own light, as you can see here. So that is actually the bioluminescence of a comb jelly. Uh, and here I'll get rid of our, I'll get rid of us here so you can see it even a little bit better. So this right here is that bioluminescence that you're, that you're referencing there, Rob, where the animal is actually making its own light. That's what a comb jelly looks like when it's making its own light. All right. Anyway, from that, uh, Emily, I'm sure we've got some more questions out there for, for Rob there. Yeah, I actually have two wonderful questions. I'm going to start with my favorite of the two. Um, people are curious, that picture that you have behind you of the Tomopterus worm, what's the mustache looking thing on it? <laughs> uh, the, the long antennae here, I, I assume that's what they mean by the mustache looking yes, thing? Yes, yes. Okay, so those are those are antennae, and I think uh, they, they certainly are sensitive to their environment. They probably help these animals to feed their predators uh, for the most part. And they have this sort of irreversible 
mouth part that many worms, many, many polychaetes, which these are, have this sort of reversible mouth parts, almost like a harpoon that they can use to um, capture prey and bring them back in. But they also need to avoid being captured themselves. And, and that's usually what these sort of sensory structures are that let, look rather like a mustache. Wonderful. And our I should other question. My background, we... shouldn't I? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the other question that we had is uh, what kind of animals might like to eat Tomopterus? That's a great question. I, you know, they're a kind of a hearty chunk of protein compared to, well, uh, compared to many animals that are out there. They're, they're at least sizable. Um, I think other worms, fishes, would uh, eat tomatrids as, you know, I mean, so I could even see uh, one tomatrid eating another. We have seen, I think, tomatrids in the gastrozoids, which are the stomach parts of uh, apolemia. But yeah, there's a lot. So remember that in the deeper ocean, you know, there are, there's no photons of light that are getting down once you get past several hundred meters, um, at least no photons of light from the sun. Okay, the light comes from whatever may be bioluminescent down there, and that's not enough to photosynthesize by. So most of the things in the mesopelagic and bathypelagic ocean, uh, they have to be predators and, and feed on each other or feed on that rain of detritus that you see coming down there behind George. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I hope the folks out there are having a solid connection. Uh, I just had some uh, flare ups over here saying that maybe we were uh, dropping some frames. So hopefully everybody heard that that response over there. If you didn't hear everything that Rob just said, um, ask it again and we'll, <laughs> we'll get back to it. <laughs> um, but Rob, OK, so, may, so we, we talked about Tomopterus worms. Um, just two rapid fire questions before we maybe move on to to a different organism. How big are they if you haven't said that uh, previously? And then does anything eat them um, that you know of? Oh, we were just talking about what might eat Tomopterus oh, worms. OK, sorry. I, yeah. They, no, it's OK. I don't know what I what what. Uh, what transmitted and what didn't, but okay. I think there are a lot of things, you know, from other tomopterids might potentially, they might eat each other, uh, to fishes. I could see uh, finding a tomopterid to be a good meal. And I believe that we have seen tomopterids in the stomach parts in the gastrozoids of some cyphonophores. Right. Okay. Sorry, everybody. I, I'm just crash landing back into this presentation that I'm running here, trying to fix the, the tech. Thank you, Rob, for, for reiterating just for me. Now I know. Uh, there you go. You're all caught up. Pat, every, the chat who's... is saying that everything's looking good. Everything's on, looking on good. Computer. Okay, cool. I had a whole bunch of red lights uh, <laughs> popping up there. So um, I'm glad. Okay. All right. I'm back uh, if you needed me. Um, so Rob, uh, can you tell us? Uh, oh, okay. Great. We, we've got we've got the next animal there uh, in the background. Uh, who is that there? Who's that marvelous mollusk there in the background? Oh, <laughs> it is indeed a mollusk. You're right. That That is Galatuthis, the cockatoo squid. Um, is showing that, you know, a lot of animals are gelatinous, you know, not just things like that we think of as a jellyfish or as a medusa. Uh, squid can be pretty gelatinous as well. And, and this one uh, is pretty much see-through. So you can look and you can see that the, the feathery bits here are actually, there's one gill. And then if I can bring it, there's the other gill. You may, we mentioned uh, they, they, do actually have an ink sac, okay, which you see there. And then at the base of each gill, there's a heart and they have a central heart as well. So kind of handy uh, that these guys are see-through and we can get close enough footage with the ROVs like like this image where we can see a lot of in, interior parts as well. Pretty and we're, cool. we're seeing that red camouflage coloration again, right? So sure, right, that's right. So it was an ink sac or uh, with a stomach in case they ingest bioluminescent prey. That's right, yeah. Good, good awesome, call. and uh, here I've got some video of uh, of one of these squid there, the, the cockatoo squid in the background, also sometimes called glass squid, right? Right, yep. Awesome, so there it is there in the background, everybody, really, really, uh, uh, amazing animal. And here I've got a video of a cockatoo squid inking um, there. And this particular cockatoo squid is putting ink into its mantle. I don't know if you've seen um, that particular 
uh, video previously there, Rob, where it's putting that ink inside its body cavity. Yeah, it's kind of like inhaling the smoke from the cigar. You know, it. it uh, <laughs> I'm. I'm. We're not exactly sure why they do that. We had um, a graduate student, Stephanie Bush, who was interested in maybe there was a toxic component to that ink if that would make them taste bad. But uh, she never found anything that was conclusive that leave the case with that. So, yeah, I have seen that. We've all we have awesome. seen that, but uh, not sure why they do it. Nice. Well, that's that's the cockatoo squid video that I've got here for the moment, but I'm sure we've got some questions out there here. Uh, Emily, what do the folks want to know out there about? Yeah, maybe we'll start with this question. Uh, why have they evolved to be transparent and how does that help them to survive? Well, you know, it's sort of interesting. I mean, I guess you could ask the question too, why are so many things in the deep sea red when they're trying to to blend in and you know maybe the answer is in a place where there isn't any downwelling light you know it it doesn't really matter whether you're clear or whether you're red you know if you were red for example you'd be illuminated by that longer wavelength red light that comes down but that's that's low energy light and that's the first to fade out the most shallow uh of the light wavelengths to fade out into the ocean so you may as well be, uh, it, it's as good to be red as it is to be black in the deep sea and, and maybe uh, clear as well in this case. So the, certainly clear, you know, you're not sort of investing any metabolic energy in making pigments. So if there's no light that's going to illuminate you, maybe it just doesn't matter. Interesting. Uh, George, Susan, feel free to weigh in if you have other ideas on that. Yeah, I know uh, uh, one of the things that I've that I've heard previously, too, is that if you are transparent like uh, this cockatoo squid here um, that you were mentioning previously, uh, I know that from certain angles, this transparency can become a mirror uh, is what people were were potentially mentioning. So um, filling themselves up with that ink might help get rid of that mirror like Sheen if they feel like they've been discovered and oh, this presentation's. We're, we're covering up the squid right now. Well, okay, we're, we're, we're fine here. I'll, I'll transition us back over here. Um, so uh, that is uh, one thing that, I, that I'd heard previously. Um, and now that Susan and George know that they're on screen, does anyone want to add anything? And, and I will say that most, most, even though these guys do spend most of the time clear like this, they do have pigmentation and they do have cells with some pigmentation and, and using muscular contractions, they can expand or uh, contract those pigment cells and they can they can actually look more opaque than they do now they can change their color they can even look a little bit reddish um and I, you may have some video of Taonius is another squid that is rather clear but they can go a deep deep red color if it wants to and i don't know if you would have video of that or not let me see if i've got Taonius in here i don't believe so yeah it is probably very expensive energetically to be transparent and uh, I think I think those that decide or those that are transparent are doing it again for survival, as Rob mentioned. And if you look at that picture behind them, you see the gut is deeply pigmented. And that's presumably to hide the bioluminescence of any food that it might eat uh, so that it's protected um, from glowing animals in its gut, uh, which is which it wouldn't need if it could really be dark, dark red and hide what it's eating, but it's also energetically expensive to put, to make yourself a, dark, a deep red too. Uh, so it's a really tough game that these animals have to play in the midwater of trying to survive, you know, not only finding food and finding mates, but also avoiding being eaten. It's a, it's a tough life down there. It's rough. Um, I, and you know, something else, Patrick, yeah. that I guess uh, I can point out while we're looking at it is you can see in the eye of this animal what looks to be a really reflective lens there mm -hmm. in the bottom. I mean, and these animals are, are definitely keenly aware of light. So what, what that is, is if, if they're shallow enough in the water column that there is some, down, some downwelling light that uh, they're experiencing, then they can use bioluminescence and actually match that downwelling light so that there isn't a shadow cast of those big 
eyes, for example, so they can kind of illuminate. So there's something from underneath them that was looking up would not be able to see them, their eyes silhouetted against that downwelling light, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, and so no matter how, if you watch this video of this squid, you'll see as it, as it changes orientation, uh, the lenses in the eyes always keep maintain the wow. same. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, for those of you folks out there, uh, they would be like playing hide and seek in the middle of a field. And if somebody was standing and you were blocking the sun and so there's an obvious shadow in front of you and mounted on your belly were a whole bunch of bright lights that match the sun's intensity. So someone standing in front of you can't see the shadow that's being that's being cast um, by that. So imagine obviously on much smaller scales, much, much lower intensity of light. But imagine you could hide out in the middle of a field and nobody can see your sh and you're hiding because no one can see your shadow blocking the, the sunlight. Um, pretty uh, incredible adaptation there. I want to play uh, just this video of a lanternfish, um, uh, just because it has a really good uh, it's a really good representation of these of these photo force. So similar concept here with this lanternfish. When you see it uh, swim around here, everybody, you'll see these bright dots there on its belly, right there, and the um, camera pauses on that, so you can see those are the uh, little organs on this particular fish that's helping it hide similarly to um, what's on the eyes there of that squid. So this is uh, shown up several different times in, in the midwater. That was the, the only video I remember really having that good one there. So, um, Patrick, yes. the, other, the other ones that you might have, um, Coleotis, the viper fish has those photo photophores and then uh -huh. the, dragon, the dragon fish, um, Stomius and Aristostomius. Yes. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Here's the scaleless dragonfish. Thanks, Susan. Here, I'll uh, play that one real quick. So here's that dragonfish again with that counter illumination. Uh, we talk about counter shading at the aquarium uh, when it comes to penguins having a white belly and a black back uh, to hide from above and from below from, you know, bright looking up and dark looking down. If you're in the deep with very little light, uh, then you make your own light to make your belly. Okay, so there that was, let's see. Stomius, another fish there. Oh yeah, thanks Susan. Beautiful stuff. Okay, all right, back to the group shot here, everybody. And Emily, what do the folks wanna know out there? Well, we were just talking about their eyes. Uh, folks are curious, do they have good vision? Do we know anything about their vision with those big old eyes of theirs? Uh, well, they certainly have been, yeah, they're very, they're very visual predators for the most part. And, and yes, um, you know, most cephalopods have, have a lot of energy devoted to their eyes and their eyes are, are pretty incredible. And, you know, it is, it is a good question because you think about a dark environment like a cave where a lot of animals have evolved to no longer have eyes or have their eyes, you know, greatly reduced, but that is not the case down in the midwaters and, and in the bathypelagic waters because animals are picking up on that bioluminescence that and, and eat, communicating with it, using it as a means to, uh, to hunt. Um, but yeah, their, their eyes are typically quite good. Yeah, and I'm playing uh, here a sword tail squid behind you with some, with some beautiful eyes. Uh, here's a, a corkscrew squid. Uh, you can see there the, those big eyeballs there. But if we're going to talk about eyes in the midwater, um, just a, a fan favorite out there real quick. I'm, I'm going to pull up here uh, barrel eye real quickly, uh, because if there was ever an animal adapted and known in popular culture uh, to look for downwelling light and other, and other shadows and such, um, it's uh, the barrel eye, which is behind you right now, Rob. I don't know if you, uh, we, we have not talked about this before, but do you feel like talking about barrel eye uh, real quick? Sure, sure. So, I mean, barrel eye is an incredible animal, that's for sure. I mean, and, and that was, this is a fish that is uh, four, maybe six centimeters long. So it's not a huge fish. It's great video, makes it look really, really large. But this is a fish that was known, you know, to science for quite some time. Um, before we really learn some important and, and interesting things about them and uh, by using observation, you know, from our ROVs. I mean, so, so we collect these animals. I mentioned that they often in, in trawl nets don't look the same uh, as they do 
in situ when you're looking at them with your ROV. And, and this is an animal that would come up without that transparent front piece all the time, it, you know? And so when we first saw that, uh, that was, that is something that was, was novel. So they've got these two little eyes that seem to be looking straight up and then this transparent cover over there, which is a modified scale. Um, but, but it wasn't clear, you know, that they had that when, when you looked at the trawl specimens and it's sort of hard to figure when you have these eyes that look straight up and this sort of little poochy mouth that's straightforward, how in the world are you going to feed with that? Um, I mean, that's, that's, it's hard to imagine, but one thing we were able to see with the ROVs is that those eyes can actually rotate and look up or look forward. And so the speculation and, and uh, that Bruce had, and I remember when we were talking about this is that, you know, maybe these guys with that little poochy mouth, they're, they're actually evolved to kind of pick the, you know, to kind of navigate in amongst the tentacles of something like a siphonophore and actually pick the prey items that have already been caught by an animal like that with that little poochy mouth without getting stung themselves. Um, don't know, but it's a, it's a fascinating thing to think about. And we'd never have made the observation of how the eyes actually work if we weren't able to look at that, you know, with, with the ROV and watch the animal live in its own habitat. And I've got video playing uh, right now behind you, Rob, of a siphonophore that has caught a fish um, there in its tentacle. Siphonophores are these rope-like, uh, rope-like jellyfish cousins. Basically, these all those tentacles there are stinging, and they're some of the top predators there in, in that midwater. And so, like you were mentioning, barrel eye might go up and use that use that scale uh, shield basically to go in amongst the the nettles and go pick out some berries uh, from. From in there. Right, right. Good, good analogy there. Yeah, exactly. Cool. I love, I love that story so much. Okay, let's see if I can get everybody back here on screen. Perfect. Okay, so I had to mention Barrel Eye. Emily, of course, Barrel Eye is in Animal Crossing: uh, New Horizons, the game that we sometimes stream on our on our on our channel. Rob, I don't know if you've um, kept up on the twenty hours of lore of us <laughs> watching Animal Crossing. That was part of your your prep. But anyway, that <laughs> that um, Barrel Eye is in that video game. So for for the parents out there, anybody watching. Uh, We've talked about Barrel Eye and Vampire Squid and a few other things from from. Uh, oh, that's cool! Oh, I have to check yeah. that out for yeah, sure. It, yeah, right. It, it's in there. Have they, have they made it to socks yet? Can we get Can we get socks with Barrel Eyes on them? Can we get what with Barrel Eyes? Socks, socks with Barrel socks. Eyes. Socks! Oh I'm my goodness! That. Get yeah. let's get that merch going out there. Yeah, that's oh, right. Barrel Eye socks! That'd be awesome. We have a we have a sticker. We have a sticker. That's right. Oh, do I have the sticker here? Hold on. <laughs> George does. All right, George. There's George. <laughs> hey, that's pretty. I don't have that. No, I I only have fang tooth and a few other things. Yeah, if you're looking for uh, only, uh, we've got um, oh, we've got sea oh, pigs. No. If you're looking for merch, we're just gonna do a quick little plug section, everybody. Uh, we've got a vampire squid sticker. We've also got the harp sponge, carnivorous harp sponge out there. Uh. Bloody Billy Comb Jelly, which you may have seen in our latest announcement about uh, Into the Deep exhibit there on the New York Times. And then I've got Fang Tooth. I do not have Barrel Eye, but it exists. Yeah. And just a plug for our social media. You, if you guys follow us on Instagram, we have been doing giveaway, sticker giveaways there. There you go. So another, sure. reason, another reason <laughs> to follow out there. Um, okay. So I've uh, been talking a little bit about few different animals, siphonophores, barrel eye, squid, lots of different topics there, counter illumination, uh, transparency, red color. So lots of things out there to, to discuss. Uh, Emily, what do the folks want to know out there? Well, Pat, you just had that video of a siphonophore up. Um, we actually had a question uh, over on Twitch about a specific siphonophore, Rob, and, and I'm curious if you might know this, have there ever been any dandelion siphonophores spotted in Monterey Bay. Do you know anything about Ooh. them? Are those the benthic uh, dromalia? Yeah, there's, George, there's dromalia. dromalia. Dromalia, Alexandria. So yeah. that should be on the link drive. It should be. Yeah. Okay, I'm going benthic. 
I'm going anemones and kin. And Trooper then, saying her, yep, Patrick. <laughs> I know, Trooper. Hold on, okay. Uh, what's it called again? Dromalia, D R O. D R O. I don't think I see Dromalia in the link here. We'll look for it. But in any case, tell us about it while I while I scoot around in here. Well, I can't I can't tell you too much about Dromali except they are really cool. And the dandelion Stephana for is a, is an appropriate common name for sure because they they do kind of look like a ball of of dandelion. Oftentimes we see them when I have seen them, uh, and Suze is probably Susan has probably seen a lot more than I have, but we often see them floating just above the bottom with their tentacles kind of draping draping down, uh, not in the midwater. Is that would you agree with that, Susan? Yeah, and they actually, I, I believe they attach to the bottom with those tentacles and then they kind of just bob around on top. Um, so that's a really interesting observation. Well, we just, oh, George has it as his background. Yeah, now. we just, oh, there we go. Yep. We, just stumped, we just stumped the link clips over here. Oh, I don't, don't have, have it, it, but I'm going to spotlight George here real quick. Uh, George, tell us about what's there in the background. Sorry, Rob. Uh, Somebody asked about benthic siphonophores. We got to talk about them. <laughs> sure. So we have two benthic siphonophores here, Dramalia. Uh, they're separate uh, individuals, one on one on either side of my face here. And they're really beautiful animals. And they were first given their nickname way back, not with Embari, but with other researchers who were trying to collect these animals from the deep sea. And unfortunately, uh, their collection containers were not adequately protected from pressure changes. And so when they came up to the surface, all they had were just pieces. Ooh. And so they nicknamed it the dandelion because that's kind of what it looked like on the ground and in the container when it came back up. Uh, since then, we've been able, to, we've had some success about collecting these live, but haven't had too much success about keeping them alive permanently or for longer term but they do tend to drift above the bottom. Sometimes they are attached to the bottom and presumably they're feeding on all the goodies that live right on or right above the bottom. Yeah, That's and so I'll cool. just add what, um, something what George said reminded me of how a lot of these siphonophores and Rob can speak to this, they, they often do explode. They, we call them like exploding siphonophores <laughs> when we come upon them sometimes even just as a reaction to the light from the rov they'll explode and all their parts will start floating around so they're a very they're really challenging to collect and we have to be incredibly careful when we do um rob might be able to talk about like nanomia is a smaller one that we can get them this they'll squeak up and then we can put them in the detritus sampler and generally have them intact, but they're really challenging to collect. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. And they're they're really reactive to light as well. They don't have eyes per se, but they're photosensitive. And so a lot of times uh, you'll get this reaction where they, they see light and swim down, even if Nanomia is very common. And it's a super important player out in the bay because Nanomia um, I'm, I'm, you know, not sure what video you have of the, the common Physonex siphonophore anomia, but, but those guys appear in, in really high numbers in our time series, and they can really, they, at least as adults, they seem to prey maybe exclusively on euphausids, on krill, uh, at least that's what we have found in their stomachs when we've looked, uh, and they are occur in such high numbers that they can really do some damage on the local krill populations as well. Wow. Really neat, really neat animal. Yeah, I've got um, this video of Nanomia there uh, in, in the background right now, uh, Rob, just kind of doing its thing and it's going to swim up and, and, and away. But uh, so this, this, little, this little jelly here next to us, uh, competing with whales in the in the Monterey Bay on, on their way with, with krill is that is that what uh, we're mentioning or no no harm to, to to whales out there the 
they're they're doing well fine. i mean they they certainly if by eating krill they they eat the same food and they're around in in really high numbers and and some of those bits that you see so the cyphosome is the long dangly part um and the swimming bells are probably if i remember the, if i know the video clip you you showed it, it uh, we're at the top part mm -hmm. and they they can essentially uh, along the cyphosome they're usually a dozen or so gastrozoids, which are the stomachs. So siphonophores are colonial animals, but all the different parts sort of uh, are, they are dependent on each other, you know, so the, the parts that feed generate food for the rest of the animal. The siphosome can't feed for itself, the nectosome can't feed for itself, but the nectosomes are the parts that the individuals that swim. But since they're all kind of tied together, ecologically, they function as a single unit, even though they're a colony. And they can feed, you know, each nanomia can feed on multiple krill uh, at a time, two or three krill. And, and we have okay. uh, quantitative data for these guys dating back over 20 years to sort of show their population cycles in the bay. And, and they can reach exceedingly high numbers um in our transects in our time series that's awesome uh i want to point out uh just one thing real quick we we've talked about this previously um but just while we're in the midwater that nanomia uh what you're mentioning there that siphonophore so abundant that there are other animals that might try to mimic it and so i'll put the corkscrew squid uh video that we have up here because some ideas out there that certain squid have these really ornate tails to them, potentially as camouflage, trying to look like a, a stinging siphonophore. So here, let me put that yeah, up and in, in the background. in particular, there. no, that's a good one. Yeah, I think you mentioned Chirotuthis calyx earlier, Patrick, which is, I, I believe, the sword tail squid. Yes. And so as juveniles, as young squid, those have um, a tail that we've, you know, I think Susan would agree with me here, you know, when we're annotating our tapes, sometimes you can mistake them for being nanomia because they look so similar. But then when the, because Chirotuthis gets to be quite large, it gets to be a good deal larger than an anomia siphonophore would as they become adults, uh, they, they lose that tail. It wouldn't do them any, they couldn't fake you know, the animals out anymore. They couldn't use it as mimicry. And, yeah, we've uh, got, um, yeah, swordtail squid up right now without its tail, one of those larger ones there. But then here's Planktotuthis, uh, the corkscrew mm -hmm. squid that has that ornate tail um, off of it that it'll lose when it's an adult there. But so that's part of the uh, idea there. Um, shout out to not only all the Ambari crew, but also to our aquarist, Alicia Batondo, um, who uh, has worked on, on some of this stuff there uh, as well. Um, and also, everybody, just very quickly for for everybody here on the Zoom call, is guess what I found in the midwater clips of siphonophores? I found a benthic siphonophore, Stephalia. So I'm going to play Stephalia real quick, just because uh, we we've got we've got the we've got the clip. So here's one of those benthic siphonophores. They're benthic being seafloor, by the way, if you folks are hearing that term for the first time. Benthic seafloor, pelagic, midwater, open ocean um, animals. But look at this siphonophore doing its best, uh, doing its best anemone or uh, weather balloon, I guess, impression right here uh, up on the screen. Anybody have anything about stephalia while it's here? Yeah, we can, um, they are really closely related to the Dromalia, the other one that we were talking about. And this one, I believe, and you can tell by the background, the sea floor there, it's lava. So this one was found at a seamount, probably Davidson Seamount. And um, Steve Haddock has, his group is really, they're the ones the most interested in siphonophores. So they'll go from the midwater down um, with the ROV and just hang just above the sea mount and try to catch these guys with a spatula. <laughs> we call it the spatulator. <laughs> so a highly a highly technical uh, bit of equipment yes. there for for Stefalia. Just, yes, we have a lot of very highly technical equipment at Ambari, and sometimes your kitchen utensils are more useful. <laughs> 
That's awesome. I'll see if I can find uh, a spatula over there. But uh, it's been a minute since we've checked in with Emily. Uh, you're still standing, not floored by all of the questions um, there. But what, what do the folks want to know? We've talked about a few different things now. Um, and then uh, Rob will also get to what is um, there behind you here in just a second. But just maybe a couple of guiding questions here. Well, Patrick, I was just going to say, uh, we're not floored uh, by the conversation, but our minds are being uh, exploded just like a <laughs> dandelion siphon before. That's what uh, happens when you bring the light of knowledge to everybody yeah. is minds will be blown like a dandelion siphon before. People have said this for a long time, Emily. This is We're not making that up right now. It's no. true. It's true. Uh, well, a couple of questions have come in, and, and I definitely want to uh, make sure that we get to some of these Um one of them, when you had the corkscrew squid up there, Patrick, uh, folks curious about what that corkscrew's function is. Um, and uh, we also had one that I particularly liked in here, uh, Rob specifically, uh, do you have any favorite weird animal? Uh, what's the weirdest thing that you have seen in the deep sea before? <laughs> Who gets to go first? Uh go for it rob yeah i mean we we, we can just mention <laughs> very quickly choice. that uh the corkscrew squid there it's thought that maybe that tail there is for camouflage make it maybe look more like a stinging siphonophore there uh and then rob let me transition to you what's going on right there uh, you know I, <laughs> I that's a really tough question to answer because a lot <laughs> of things seem weird out there you know the truth is definitely stranger than fiction but I'll kind of turn that back uh, to the questioner and, and just sort of ask, does anybody know what this is? I've Can never seen this before, I'm personally. Looking. George, That's no. The, this is, George, no. This is a silence. <laughs> <laughs> this is the esca of an anglerfish. So anglerfish oh. themselves are pretty fantastic animals. And they have, there's a weird sexual relationship there where females are large and males are tiny and parasitic on the females but then it's real horton here's a who stuff because the closer you drill down the more you drill down into these things this is the fishing lure of uh one type of angler fish and it looks maybe it's got some appendages here it looks a little bit perhaps like a copepod uh that could bioluminesce and this is how the angler fish attracts her prey in toward her um, but different species of anglers will have different kinds of esca different kinds of lures and this is just a picture that was taken through a through a microscope a close-up i just have to chime in as zimbari's content manager like rob that is the coolest photo i've ever <laughs> seen <laughs> and how have you been hiding it rob give it up all? <laughs> I, you know, I got, I still got, there's things you don't know about me, Sue. I know. Well, so yeah, you took that at sea on the, with the microscope? That it, it was actually in the lab on a microscope. Okay. And do you know which wow. angler fish? Uh, off the top of my head, no, that's a great question, but I have it, I could, we could find it out. Yeah, cool. And, and I think Patrick is showing the, um, the one angler fish shot that we have but we have another video on yeah. our youtube channel about a different angler fish that you probably all have seen everyone on youtube has seen this video <laughs> one of your many viral sensations yeah the uh, <laughs> the black sea dragon angler fish this is a smooth dreamer angler fish uh on the road on the on a road roads on your roads on roides okay so <laughs> <laughs> apologies to the to the folks out there um esca by the way um is the name of my underwater uh camera it's one of my favorite uh terms there and if i if i had a child i would probably you know posit esca would be uh, a good name so for the nerds out there uh i'm looking at the time we've got about five minutes left here in the hour we've talked about a lot of different things here uh rob uh traditionally here in the last few minutes emily uh, is going to hit us with some rapid fire questions if there happen to be any these should be uh very quick uh answers um so emily if you're ready to throw in the throw the gauntlet out to uh to rob here um what what do the folks want to know fast All action right. Uh, Rob, do most marine animals see in color? Whew, great one. Um, 
I actually do not know, uh, but I think probably not. I think most of them tend to have more rods than cones, but that that is not universally true. And I know that, for example, things where that, that live where there is a lot of light, like mantis shrimp that live up shallow, I think they have, we have four different types of cones, they have 12. So they're excellent at seeing in color, but down in the, in the deep waters, I'm not so sure that's true. All right. Awesome. Midwater sharks, what's your opinion on them? <laughs> Glad I use an ROV. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, have you ever discovered any new species? Ah, wow. Okay, the, tough to, we see things that we're unsure about all the time. And our lab has, has, has made several descriptions over the years for sure. And, and well, quite a few descriptions over the years for sure. Most recently, um, we described a new species of giant larvacean uh, that lives in the bay and uh the but there's several more in the works so that i'd love to launch into more of a story about that stuff but but the short answer is yes we see things we don't know all the time and there are certainly things that that still call out to be described and and, and that's um it's important to have a name to put on things and uh, we do work on that but but those kinds of descriptions oftentimes take a lot of time and 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 effort so it takes a long time to, to get them all out but in yeah, the background, the in the background right now, I have one of our giant larvations, uh, Bathocordaeus, there in the background. If you folks wanted to watch Kakani's uh, amazing talk, uh, Mysteries of the Deep, we talk all about those mucus houses there. All right, Emily, more questions. All right, Rob, do you have a favorite ROV? Oh, I don't, I, you know, they've all been such workhorses for us, you know, that in fact, a real shout out to not only the ROVs, but to the, our, our, our DMO, our dive maintenance operations guys, because honestly, without the ship's crew and the ROV pilots, we could not do what we do. Um, and so, but and they keep the ROVs running. Um, and yeah, they're both Ventana and the Doc Ricketts, as well as our mini ROV are very capable and and often for 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 different reasons awesome are there any deep water mantis shrimp not that i know of Ooh. all right be i really be like very this. afraid if there were yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> clams Lots of, of big deep, deep amphipods that's for sure but uh <laughs> bigger than mantis shrimp but, but yeah <laughs> Um, I really liked this one. Uh, why do animals in the deep sea always seem so much more bizarre than the fish that we're familiar with up here, kind of towards the uh, the photic zone? Well, there's some pretty bizarre ones up here too. You know, if you think about things like a frogfish, for example, uh, which are related to angler fishes, and the, I mean, holy smokes, uh, or a seahorse. I mean, crazy. Uh, so I think it's a matter of what we're familiar with probably most of the time. And uh, yeah, there's certainly some bizarre things that, that live shallow as, as well as deep. Mm -hmm. And currently behind you there, Rob, I have uh, a sea toad. I apologize that you know we're showing so many benthic things in this midwater uh, marvels, but related to anglerfish, you can actually see the, the lure tucked in neatly there. Uh, in the forehead, but here, just to make sure that it is a midwater presentation, here's that sea toad swimming. So there you go, everybody. We're st sticking with the theme of the water column there. Okay. All right. Enough, enough indulgence on my end. Uh, Emily, yes. looks like we've got about a minute left here. So let's hit Rob with the, the hard hitting question that we always uh, wrap up with. Go for it. All right. So Rob, we have obviously a ton of ocean-minded, ocean-enthusiastic people watching the stream right now. I've seen a couple of teachers watching with their students um, and just learners of all ages. For someone who is interested in getting into deep sea science, do you have any advice for them? And how did you get your job? Okay. Uh, wow. So much more I was going to talk about here. I uh, This has really flown <laughs> An by. An hour goes quick. <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, for me, it was kind of a gradual process. I mean, I grew up in the desert, so I think deprivation of water deprivation had uh, water deprivation had a lot to do with it, honestly. Um, but I was greatly influenced by a professor named J.R. Hendrickson when when I was in college, and I took a very fundamental marine bio course uh, that I then became a, a an undergraduate teaching assistant for, and that was was pivotal and what was pivotal about it was just getting to know some people uh in a discipline that i thought i wanted to study so so really take advantages no matter what your field is no matter what your discipline is if you're in school find somebody who's doing what you like what you're interested in what you think you're interested in and 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 follow them around and take classes from them or see if you can volunteer with them and that'll give you some real world experience that you can use to make you know knowledgeable decisions going forward and it will also give you uh some contacts that will be beneficial to you in the future you know and so so take advantage of, of internship opportunities like we have here at the monterey bay aquarium research institute uh george matsumoto has a wonderful internship program that he has uh, run for many years successfully and you know uh other things you can do even as parents with kids you know who you want to sort of set on you know that path make sure they get some experiences at things like outdoor education facilities or in camps because it kind of those are sort of like internships for children and that kind of gets them thinking along those lines and in fact uh George and uh, I and Paul Clarkson at the aquarium, uh, Kira Schlinning here, Tommy Knowles at the aquarium all came from a background where we spent some time, and, and there are actually many more folks but at both Navari and at the aquarium who spent some time uh, down at the Catalina Island Marine Institute before we began our professional lives here. So those kinds of experiences are, are hugely helpful and they start very young. That's right. Oh, shout out to Simi there, uh, Rob. Yeah, lots of Simiites uh, around the Monterey Bay area. Um, thank you so much uh, for for all of that uh, information and for all of the folks out there that are tuning in. Um, another, I feel like uh, car talk almost, you know, another perfectly hour of your time has, uh, has come and gone. Um, thank you so much for spending that hour with us, learning about these midwater marvels of the Monterey Bay. As Rob mentioned, we didn't even cover half of it um, that, uh, that, that we want to talk about. So plenty more. Um, Rob, we'll, we'll have you back on uh, to talk about everything that we that we didn't. Um, but just very quickly, if uh, we could in the chats uh, over on Twitch, on YouTube, everywhere else, we could just get um, uh, some um, a round of applause for Rob over here on this side. Rob, thank you so much for uh, for your, your expertise and, and your time. Thank you, everybody. Um, and then if we could also give a, a huge round of, of applause, some, uh, some GGs, some otter uh, emotes over on, on Twitch for Emily for uh, looking at all of those uh, questions, for George over here for uh, answering so many questions over on Facebook, and uh, to Susan as well for being over there on YouTube, on Twitter, uh, all around the internet all the time for uh, Mbari. Um, any final words, everybody? Otherwise, we'll, we're... we're it's pretty much lunchtime. What do we think? Anything we need to talk about? Look at that. We're good. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, we hope to deep see you all again soon here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium and the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute social media feeds. Give us a follow. Give us a like. Share this content if you enjoy it. And uh, thank you for joining us for yet another episode of Mysteries of the Deep. Hope you have a fantastic rest of your day, everybody. Talk to you again very soon and i really wish that i had keyed up the ending slate before i went into that the ending slate is now keyed up and there we go thanks everybody thanks a lot patrick a lot of fun thanks for the great questions bye thanks rob